Hello, I'm Randy with Zoll Medical. Today we're going to go over the X-Series. Uh, please ask questions as we go. The goal of today's session is that after we're done that you're able to deploy the devices and use them in the field. Um, there are some online modules available if you'd like any follow-up training that uh, Beth and Chris have access to. And I'm always available as well to ask questions as we go through this or after the fact feel free to call email or text me and we'll get you taken care of. But ask questions as we go today. We'll go over all the operation of the X-Series and you will be ready to deploy the devices. So. First and foremost, the X-Series is a battery-operated device. It is operated off one lithium-ion battery in the back of the device. Runtime on the battery will be approximately six to seven hours for you. They do need to be rotated on a daily basis if you go by the book, but at least on a monthly basis through a base charger that's probably somewhere here um, in this room. There is one button on the base charger to deep cycle the battery. Press the one button in front of the charger, takes it all the way down to zero, builds it all the way back up. Won't improve your runtime, but it will improve the lifetime of your battery. If at any time your battery is dead or you lose power to the device or you can plug it in the AC-DC cord, this will charge the battery quicker than it can ever be depleted. So even if you put a completely dead battery in the device, plug it in here and that'll keep your battery vibrant. If you keep the battery plugged in in the truck, the way it operates is once the battery hits 95%, it tops itself back off so you'll have a vibrant battery at all times. But at a minimum, don't forget to run them through the charger every 30 days put that on your checklist. There is a runtime indicator on the battery, but there's also a runtime indicator on the front, front of the screen as well that tells you how much time is left on the device, or on the battery. Left-hand pouch are our parameters. Parameters include SpO2, 4 and 12 lead monitoring, non-invasive blood pressure, and end tidal CO2. Right-hand pouch is our critical access side that includes cardioversion, defibrillation, and pacing. There's also a USB port over here that has a, a cell modem hooked to it that will allow you to transmit 12 leads. It will try to hook to the truck first and that's a fail safe just so you know what's over there. That USB port in the right hand pouch also allows you to update software from time to time. Zoll will update the software or download your patient information to put it into your image trend charting but we'll be doing that wirelessly I believe first off. So hard keys down the right hand side and across the bottom we call them hard keys because they have pictures or words on them meaning they do specific things versus the soft keys on the left hand side soft keys when the device the x-series is turned on will have little pictures inset here depending on what therapy you're in or what you're trying to treat the patient those pictures may change ready for use up uh, indicator in the upper right hand corner if you do ever see a no smoking sign up there or the ghostbuster sign the first step is to replace the battery chances are the battery needs to be recalibrated Second thing to do is turn the device on. Every time the X-Series is turned on or off, it will do a self-test on itself. If you see the no smoking sign there, you've replaced the battery, and that does not remove the no smoking sign or the Ghostbuster sign, turn the device on, it'll give you a prompt on the screen telling you what the issue is. I've never seen it be anything but the battery, quite frankly, just so you know. If you're diligent about rotating your batteries, you should be fine. Green power button on top turns the device on. As I mentioned, it will do a self-test on itself every time it's turned on. You'll see a series of lights come across the top of the screen, as well as an inset box here telling you self-test passed. Now keep in mind these devices can be configured any way you want. We did kind of do a general configuration, but just so you know, if you'd like the screen to present a different way, you'd like a different view on there, let, um, let one of the supervisors know and they can change that for you. Okay. Question so far? I do need a guinea pig. We'll start with SpO2 as well as blood pressure. They all ran away here when I said I need a guinea pig. You're getting further away. 10 foot hose though, we can reach anybody, right? Up and down. <laughs> <clears throat> we're, we're next up. Wait, what is it? Zoom in on this. So we want to make sure it's a correctly sized cuff. We know the cuff is correctly sized when the artery index marker is over our artery. And that marker falls within the range, which are these two white lines. Okay, so that cuff is perfectly sized. There are four cuff sizes included with the X-Series today. If you feel like you need additional sizes, let us know there are 16 sizes available. There is no reason not to use the correct size cuff. It is very easy to clip on and clip off to adjust the cuff size. So if we go back over here, to take a blood pressure on the monitor, back this way to the monitor, can you see the monitor? Okay, you're zoomed out, thank you. Press the person's hand or the person's arm with the cuff on it, it will start to count up and take the blood pressure. While we're doing a blood pressure, we'll talk about SpO2. SpO2 is very simple. 
Um, the SPO2 is a, a more advanced than some of our previous versions. We do not need to remove fingernail polish or fake or acrylic nails anymore. Put it on the finger and it will give you a reading as well as a heart rate. Notice the blood pressure cuff on one arm, the SPO2 on the second arm. Our blood pressure is designed to do three specific things. First thing it's designed to do is take on the inflation, which you notice there. Most of the time, generally speaking, it'll take on the inflation. It's about a 10 to 12 second period of time. The reason we do this is to get away from patient discomfort, where it squeezes their arm, makes the patient's fingers tingle, and it's more accurate the less patient movement we have involved in that. Second thing is, if you're having trouble re um, recording a blood pressure or you feel like that it is off, you can attach four leads or pads to the patient. With leads or pads attached to the patient, with a QRS complex on the screen, the monitor will marry up the heartbeat in the arm with the QRS complex on the screen. So in essence, what we're doing there is filtering out any bumps or road noise or artifact that might be created by the EMS environment or the patient themselves moving. So it's still very accurate. If we put the four leads or pads on, it can catch on the deflation, might take 90 seconds to two minutes, but it still will be accurate. Third thing on the blood pressure, just so you know, if you ever get an asterisk there where the blood pressure is taken, that's basically telling you, hey, that's my best guess. So you might want to take it again or use your own ears, just so you know what it looks like. Uh, blood pressure is pretty simple. Press it once to start it. Press it once to stop it if you wanted to. We can also program the device to take one on predetermined intervals. So if you wanted it to go every five minutes, every 10 minutes, we can do that as well. Just keep that in the back of your mind if you want to configure it that way. Okay. Note the SpO2 is in the lower uh, right-hand corner. There is a perfusion indicator there with the SpO2 as well. As long as that perfusion indicator is getting close to the top, it means it's getting a good reading. The preferred site for Massimo, which is our vendor for the SpO2 and CO, is the non-dominant ring finger. That's where they say you get the best reading, just so you know. So do as I say, not as I do. There you go, right? Second thing that'll pop up here is after we get a reading back on the SpO2 is CO, which is carbon monoxide. So, about five to 10 seconds after the SpO2 reading displays, there will be a CO reading. So think of carbon monoxide as obviously different than entitled CO2, more of the poisons from people being exposed to too much carbon monoxide, okay? You'll notice Chris will probably be at a zero or one here. A lot of people run with a little bit of CO in their system. General rule of thumb is if they get into the double digits and they are not a heavy smoker, that is something we wanna note, okay? So anytime you see a double digits, 10 or higher, just note that that is probably something uh, outside of, you know, elective things such as cigarette smoking, okay? Uh, something we can talk about too is you can set an alarm so it does alarm at you every time it is over 10 if you want to do that. That's something that's configurable as well that some people have done in the past. So you don't have to necessarily look for the number every time. Nothing to turn on there or turn off. Every time you put it on a patient's finger, it will pop up and display the SPCO reading, All right? Uh, go ahead and slip that probe off your finger. Most of the alarms are turned off on the device. Two alarms that we do not turn off is when an SpO2 probe falls off or an ECG lead pops off, okay? So we wanna make sure that you know that those things are happening. And what the way we alert you to that is, you'll see a minor alarm, which is a yellow light up here after 15 seconds of the probe being off. And once that alarm goes off, I can use my alarm acknowledgement key. Top key here on the right-hand side is an alarm acknowledgement key. By pressing that, I've cleared the alarm. It won't tell me again unless I put the probe back on the finger and it comes back off again so it doesn't keep beeping at you, reminding you. Second key down, you'll use quite a bit. It does four different things. The first thing it does is scroll through three different screen views. This is my home screen when I turn the device on. If I press the house key once, it goes to a trend screen. The trend screen is set to take any numeric value that's attached to the patient on a five minute interval. So if you wanted to see what the SpO2 trending or entitled CO2 trending was, we can press the home key once and look at it here. It will give you the vitals every five minutes or when a blood pressure is taken by pressing the blood pressure button. Press it again, we can get large numbers. A lot of people like this, it's kind of a BLS screen. There is no ECG tracing on this screen, but it would show my heart rate, my SpO2 reading with carbon monoxide as well, my last blood pressure with the time it was taken, as well as a respiration rate and an entitled CO2 rate. Press it a third time, it goes to my home screen. So that just scrolls through home screen, trend screen, the large number screen. Okay. Arrow keys will be good to get to learn how to use. The arrow keys move a blue box around the screen. Anything that has a blue box has a submenu to it, meaning you can make a change. So if you see across the top of the X series, if I highlight adult, because I know I'm going on a pediatric call, I can highlight the adult, use my enter key to turn it into a pediatric or neonatal monitor, okay? 
By turning it into a pediatric or neonatal monitor, we change the algorithms, the inflations, and we can even set specific alarms for our pediatric patients if that's something you want to configure, all right? Note that anything I change with the blue box is a patient-by-patient -patient change, meaning if I go on a pediatric call at 8 o'clock this morning, I put it in pediatric mode. When I deliver that patient, turn the device off, the next time I power it on, it will power up in adult mode, okay? So when I say it's good to use these blue boxes to move around the screen to see what you can get into, if you feel like you've turned something on or off that you don't know how to fix, simply power the device down, it will turn back on how it's configured, okay? So for instance, if I wanted to change how often a blood pressure was taken, I simply highlight the blood pressure, use my enter key to navigate through that menu. After I've made the change, the home key gets me back to my home screen, okay? We'll talk about the snapshot key next. The snapshot key is pretty slick. What the snapshot key does, it's probably happened to you before where maybe you're driving down the road, you see a change in the patient's ECG on the screen, but you cannot get to the recorder key in time. With the snapshot key, we actually allow you Hang on one second. All right, we're good. The snapshot key will actually allow you to go back in memory 12 seconds and forward 12 seconds. So if you do see a change in a rhythm on the screen, you no longer have to get to the recorder key quickly. So you see here I'm in a regular rhythm. You look up, you see something that doesn't look right, but the patient is converted back to a normal rhythm before I can get to the recorder key. By pressing the snapshot key, it will print off a strip as well as save to the memory 12 seconds before I hit the key and 12 seconds after. I would get accustomed to using the snapshot key versus the recorder key because it does give you that 24 second strip as well as your last round of vitals in the upper left hand corner and displays anything that was on the screen. Another good use of the snapshot key is if you're pushing a drug that's gonna change your rhythm, you can push the drug, wait for the rhythm change on the screen, press the snapshot key, it'll show you what the rhythm was and what we converted them to, okay? If anybody wants to look at that, you'll see a camera in the middle of the paper. They were in a run of AFib. We took the picture there 12 seconds after, 12 seconds before. That'll be able to upload into your chart as well as it does print off a copy right away. So quick review, ready for use indicator. Alarm acknowledgement key, scroll through my three screens. Arrow keys navigate me around the screen with an enter key. Snapshot key is 12 seconds before, 12 seconds after. The blood pressure key is a press it once to start it, press it once to stop it operation. We'll now move to the left-hand side of the screen to some of our soft keys. If you see the very top soft key in the upper left-hand corner, that key is simply going to scroll through the leads that I'm looking at in my top tracing. Yep. So if you press it once, it'll go to lead three, AVR, AVL, AVF, and then pads. The second key down is what we'll talk about a little bit now, which is our 12 lead. By pressing the 12 lead key or doing a 12 lead, what we do is follow the pictures. It's a very simple process to follow the pictures. I want to do a 12 lead, so I press the 12 to show 12 leads on the screen. Now you want to look at this screen and make sure you see or do not see a couple of things. We want to make sure all of our leads are attached. You notice V6 is off there now. It's giving me that minor alarm. And you want to make sure, of course, that you have good skin prep and do not see any artifact like you're seeing there in V6 now. <clears throat> When I'm ready to acquire the 12 lead, again, I follow the pictures. I want to take a picture of that 12 lead. I push the camera with the 12. The device is going to prompt me to enter a patient age and sex. Age is a range, but sex is specific due to the fact that the algorithm is different in this device for males versus females. So we want to make sure if it is a female patient that we change it to female and we can approximate their age as well. We'll leave this as a 45-year-old female. There are other fields there if you want to enter after the call, patient um, name and age as well. We generally don't enter that before we transmit because of the HIPAA uh, implications there. But again, after I have the age and sex in, I want to acquire that 12 lead by hitting the camera with the 12. You'll see the 12 lead box start to fill up here. Obviously, you want to talk to your patient, have them be as still as possible during this time. It is about a 10 to 12 second acquisition period. As soon as you see the interpretive statement on the screen and the printer starts running, the patient can get back up and move or go about doing what they were doing before. 
Okay. You'll notice this one's a STEMI. We note that by the three asterisks in STEMI with three asterisks behind it. You will see the same thing print out here on the, paper, um, on the printout. Interpretive statement first with the findings. We can look at a few different views of the 12 lead by using the arrow key to scroll through the different 12 leads. Okay. Top key changes to a V lead. We have static view of the 12 lead as well as a live view to look for any changes in the patient. Okay. Third step to a 12 lead is transmitting it. We're going to transmit the 12 lead. Again, pictures, envelope with the 12 in it. So I have an envelope with the 12. Mary Greeley is where I want to go. I select that hospital, highlight transmit, enter to send it out. Green light comes on top, you know you're good to go. Once the green lights come on on top of the device, that means you've made connectivity with your Wi-Fi access point and it has coverage, okay? Also notice transmission complete up here in the upper left-hand corner. I indicate or I instruct people to just look at the green light. It's gonna go through when that green light comes on. Should hit the ER, there's a dedicated printer in the ER and nurse's station. Should hit that ER in about 60 seconds approximately, depending on your coverage. They'll have a copy of that 12 lead. Top key to acquire a 12 lead. Second key will allow you to input patient demographics. We've seen that before. It automatically prompts us to do that. Fourth key down is where my old 12 leads are stored. So if I had acquired multiple 12 leads, needed to print another one or transmit another one, I go to the list with the check mark by it. It will save approximately 112 leads depending on what other things you're saving in the memory. Fifth key down is a black and white screen. You get outside on a day like today where it's direct sunlight. You can see the black and white screen. Um, it is nice, nice to have to use on some of these sunnier days, although the color screen is fairly easy to see as well. Two ways to get out of the 12 lead mode. I can exit 12 lead here, or I can always use my home key to go back to my home screen. Any questions? Yes. That snapshot of 12 seconds before, 12 seconds after. Mm -hmm. If you were to do that every single day, mm -hmm. how soon would your memory be taken up to that last long time? Yeah, so it's a, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory, which probably doesn't mean much, right? Um, generally speaking, that's about 120 minute calls, including including 1,000 marked events. So that would be 1,000 snapshots, 120 minute calls. So uh, I generally tell people somewhere between 75 and 150 full calls. The memory management acts as you would expect it to, where it overwrites old memory as needed. So you never lose the most recent information. If it were to fill up, it will overwrite the oldest records in its memory. So there's really no memory management to the device itself. Um, you said it holds 100 calls before you have to, it re resets itself or it starts to override? So it'll start to override, and that's approximate. Yep, approximately. Mm -hmm. It's going be a new feature because in my other place, I feel like you mm -hmm. can't download the like the log on a USB if it's full. Do it's you work for flight service? West morning. So they're currently going through the, they have this, what we call CP1 devices. They're going to a CP2 device, which is a computer processor. Uh, we're doing that upgrade for them, so they should have that soon. These all are CP2 devices that allow you to do that. So yeah, the first generation, the log would fill up, the memory would fill up, but that's not the case anymore. Yep. In tidal CO2, there's two different ways to monitor in tidal CO2. We can use an inline adapter or a nasal cannula that you're probably familiar with. Activate the in tidal CO2 by pressing the CO2 button. You'll see the waveform show up on the screen as soon as I start breathing into this. Note the entitled CO2 reading as well as my respiration rate below that. Remember, we can see these numbers larger as well if we wanted to, or my home screen with the waveform on there. The X-Series does purge, just so you know. If this does get some foreign material in it, do not try to replace the inline adapter. It will turn the pump around and unclog itself, okay? CO2 is pretty simple. Press it once to start it. Press it once to stop it. Normal range for any type of patient, of course, is 35 to 45. Code markers are the next key down. Code markers can be used if you'd like to, and these are configurable. Code markers currently today say oxygen, aspirin, morphine, nitro, what I'm doing there when I'm pressing those buttons are marking my strip. So for your post-call reporting, if I gave oxygen at 902, it would tell me on my strip that oxygen was given, give you a little 10 second strip in case it changed the rhythm. Obviously oxygen, not a good example there. Um, and you can program those to be anything you want in any order you want to. Will it put an intervention in the log? Yes. Mm -hmm. Two pages of the code markers to use there. And again, that's configurable um, to use them if you'd like. 
Synchronized cardio version we'll come back to. Recorder key I touched on briefly before. Recorder key is different than the snapshot key. Recorder key is an on-off switch. Press it to start it, press it to stop it versus the snapshot key, which will be that 24 second snapshot, no matter what. <coughs> Quick review on the right hand soft keys. Top key changes my top lead. Second key down allows me to move through the 12 lead menu. Third key down is in title CO2. Press it to start it, press it to stop it. Fourth key down are code markers. Fifth key down, we'll talk about synchronized cardio version, and then of course the recorder key. We'll now move to the right hand pouch and talk about CPR, defibrillation, pacing, and cardio version. Do we always run with a paramedic? Okay. Zoll uses what we call CPR stat pads. You might be familiar with these, but if you're not, I'll show you what they are. It's, it's like a standard defibrillation pad with pad A and pad B that monitor the heart and deliver electricity. We also have an accelerometer in the center of the pad that allows us to get CPR feedback, rate and depth, as well as what we call a perfusion indicator. Our studies show that using the CPR feedback in Mesa, Arizona, almost tripled the rate of survival for patients, so we are a firm believer in using the CPR feedback. The puck would look like this on the pad. This is a training pad, but this will go in the center of the chest where CPR takes place. So, this patient had a STEMI. I now look at the screen. I see it's bad news. I hit the simulator. Okay. So as a paramedic, I'm gonna shock this rhythm. If we're paramedics, we use one, two, three. If we want, if we ever want the device to tell us what it thinks the rhythm is, we can use the analyze key. The analyze key will activate my AED algorithm and walk you through the code. So for instance, if I press the analyze key, it's going to give me the rhythm. Oh. Press shock. I'm clear, you're clear, all clear. Perform CPR. Paramedics show up. We can hit the exit key to go back into manual mode. So let's say this is a shockable rhythm again. I want to go to 150 joules the next time, charge the device, and deliver the shock. Okay, I'm just stopping the paper there. Now, with our CPR feedback, when we start compressions, you're going to see several things pop up here on the screen. And these will pop up automatically when they're on a patient. With the simulator, I have to set it, but just so you know, when you are in the field, the filtered ECG will come up automatically. And we're going to change that. So you're probably familiar with the top rhythm here being what it looks like when we're doing compressions on a patient that is getting CPR. A few things I'll point out here on our CPR dashboard. The second spot down or the second tracing down, it will say filtered ECG when you're on an, a live patient or a patient that's experiencing cardiac, experiencing cardiac arrest. What we're doing in the second tracing there is what we call the filtered ECG. We are filtering out the CPR artifact created with our hands on the top rhythm so we can understand what the underlying rhythm is, that, is on that patient. What that allows us to do is get a shock on board much quicker when the end of my two minutes is up. That's automatic? It is. Yep. When you're on a patient. You saw me change it because the simulator doesn't turn it on automatically. Does it require the puck? Or? It does. Okay. Requires, yep. So without that. Correct. There is a countdown timer here starting with your two minutes. Push harder. You notice it tells me to push harder because my depth was push going pressure. at a less than two inch rate or two inch measurement. And if my rate slows down, a metronome will kick in to speed me back up. If the device is ever talking to you, telling you to push harder, or you hear the metronome, you either need to improve your quality of CPR or switch out to a different partner. If all of that information is too much to look at, focus on the rectangle and the diamond. If the rect rectangle and diamond are full, we are doing guideline compliant CPR. The rectangle is measuring chest recoil. If you remember, the AHA says push hard, push fast, allow for full chest recoil. So that's meaning I'm allowing the chest to come back to the neutral position. I'm not resting on the chest. And the diamond is indicating my rate and depth of at least two inches and at least 100 compressions a minute. 
Notice if I stop CPR, even for a little bit of time, how quickly the perfusion goes out of the heart and the diamond. But I know I'm getting to the end of my two minutes. So this is where filtered ECG comes in. We're at the end of my two minutes. Partner, what does that look like? Defib. Defib, charge the device. I'm continuing compressions. Device is charged. I verify one time across the screen that it is V-fib. We're all clear. I deliver the shock and I'm back on the chest. So if you notice, it's a three to five second period of time that allows us to get that shock on board, shocking a more perfused heart, therefore potentially saving more of our cardiac arrest victims. Last thing we'll note on energy is, if I do charge to 200 joules, notice 200 joules are selected. I have 30 seconds to deliver the shock. I can disarm here, or I can wait till the end of the 30 seconds. But notice selected energy, just out in the paper, and delivered energy are different. Don't worry, the monitors are supposed to do that. Our monitor and pads measure for each patient's impedance on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, meaning it's saying I needed to deliver 232 joules at the skin to get through the impedance to get exactly 200 to the heart, okay? Doesn't mean your battery's overcharged or it should be unplugged. That's a feature that it's supposed to do. Questions on defibrillation? Can you increase the size of that uh, code clock in the upper right? Uh, currently, today, we cannot. The two-minute countdown? Just, just the overall timer, you know what I mean? This whole section, or this? Can you go back one screen where you just have? Um, yep. Um, right before that, maybe. Oh, where we were doing compressions, maybe? Yeah. Upper right timer right there. The countdown from two minutes? Yeah, just so you know where you're at in your CPR, you know. Yeah, so that's what you want bigger? There is a countdown timer right here for two minutes. You mean the overall timer? The overall timer. Oh, across the top? Yeah. So up here we have real time and we have run time for when my call started. If I'm doing CPR, the countdown timer will be here in my CPR dashboard if you see that counting down. But the answer is we can't change. Countdown for you. Yep, so I'm at CPR zero, obviously, idle time of 13 seconds. Let's say I just defibrillated the patient. Once I start compressions again, see the CPR timer reset to two minutes to count down my two minutes again. Does that make sense? In AED mode, when the two minutes is up, it tells you to stand clear. In ALS mode, you do need to watch the clock. clock. a lot to give some, the first responders something to focus on. Like when we're going to go till the two minute mark here, guys. Everybody knows in the room. Push harder. So I would recommend the training is use Push this harder. as the countdown timer because it does start after I think your first six compressions, it starts at two minutes every time and counts down for you. My issue is with Lucas device, we're not gonna use that pad. So you'll still deploy, the way I understand it is, you'll still deploy the pad with the device. So if you have a few minutes of CPR first or patients that don't over. fit, um, it over it. we will use the... And then you don't have to stop CPR either. Yep. So say that again. Do what? You can put it underneath the Lucas device. Six. No. Lucas Lucas device it's over it, you to stop CPR. And that's something yeah. you would clear with them, obviously, but... Will it work with... The automatic decompression devices that we're starting to see. We will discuss this after the in service. Is that fair? Yep. Questions on shocking people? Will it filter the ECG if you're not using the hockey puck thing? It will not. The hockey puck gives us filtered ECG as well as rate and depth, perfusion indicator, and fully release indicator. Another thing that we can talk about briefly after the in-service are different systems of care that we see people using Lucas where they might do 5, 10, 15 minutes on scene before they move to mechanical CPR. There's some other things there since the new guidelines are out, but um, there's some rationale behind that we can, we can discuss. That's a reusable puck, you just wipe it off. It is not. It comes on every set of pads. It's a disposable puck. Yep. So it comes inside every set of pads, so there's nothing else to remember to grab. There's nothing else to, you just throw it all away. Mm -hmm. One thing you do want to note though, and this is tied on and I would recommend maybe even duct taping this on. This gray connector is part of my defibrillation cable. This is reusable. The part that unplugs is here. This is all disposable. But a lot of times we'll hear in a stressful code situation that this gets tossed as well. Um, try not to do that. Only, only the pads here. Other questions on defibrillation? Analyze key activates the AED. If we do want to do it ourselves, ALS, one, two, three. Pacing. We will talk about pacing next. The pacer menu is brought up by hitting the green pacer key. Now note, we do not start the pacer when the green pacing key is hit. 
that just brings up my pacing menu. Notice we still have to start pacer by scrolling to start pacer and hitting the enter key. Again, I'll just stop the paper here. I know that the monitor is delivering energy now because you see my downward P pacing spike. Now I have to obtain capture by raising my output. This simulator captures at 70. So no, I, I now know I have capture. My QRS complex is directly after my downward pacer spike. Okay. I can hit the home key if I want to view it this way. We do have what is called on-demand pacing as well as fixed pacing. Demand pacing is going to pace the heart when they need to be paced. If for some reason this patient's intrinsic rhythm takes over on its own, notice my heart rate's at 70. I have them set at 70. Patient's intrinsic rhythm takes over. We do not lose that, or excuse me, we stop pacing the patient. You notice their heart beats beating faster than I want it paced at. If a lead pops off, we need four leads on as well as pads. We look at the rhythm through the four leads. We deliver the energy through the pads. If a lead does pop off, we do not lose capture and we still pace the patient. We know we're still pacing the patient because we have that downward P spike. When I reattach the lead, I see I still have capture. It just moves to fixed pacing if a lead pops off, but we are still continuing to pace that patient. I turn the pacer off the same way I turned it on by going into the pacer menu and turning pacer off. So just to go back to the demand feature, if you, mm -hmm. when that's on, it'll just stop pacing them to the intrinsic rate. Correct. Beats the pacer. Correct. Okay. Yep. It does it on its own, so you don't have it. Well, once we have capture, it only paces a paceable rhythm to the predetermined rate we set it at. So to round off this guy's rough day, he's now in a uh, VTAC rhythm that needs to be cardioverted. Cardioversion, probably pretty similar to what you're used to. We cardiovert by hitting the sync key. I know I am using cardioversion, as you see the S marking my QRS complex, as well as it's marked here. I select what my protocols tell me for energy. I charge the device. Only difference between synchronized cardioversion and defibrillation is we have to press and hold the key for synchronized cardioversion through that entire QRS complex. Whereas defibrillation will fire the energy as soon as I press the button. Now note we are printing strips here every time we do deliver energy. That is a configurable feature too. If you don't want it to, it's always saved in the post call memory as well. And it'll stop on its own. Correct. Yep. The only time it continues to run is if I use my recorder key and don't turn it off. Every other time it's a preset limit of the strip. For instance, on defibrillation, it gives you four seconds before and six seconds after. Questions on cardioversion? If I need to cardiovert them again because the patient did not convert, I go through the same process using the sync key, increasing my energy, charging the device, and delivering the shock. You will note in the defibrillation side of the device, there are two temp probes that are switching back and forth down here, T1 and T2. These are external temp probes. These are meant to be placed on the temple, shiny side down. Most people do use them under the arm or in the groin area with a piece of tape as well. It'll give you a closer to an internal temperature, okay? There are other probes available, esophageal as well as rectal. If you're doing, do you do heating and cooling protocols at all? Okay. Um, if you do do heating and cooling protocols, the reason that we have two temps there is so you can measure the ambient air as well as the patient. But I would recommend throwing it under the arm, in the groin. That will be recorded for your post-call strip as well. So it's basically telling you what, it's 75 degrees in here roughly, and the difference between the two probes. One probe's probably been a little warmer in a different spot. It gives you the difference of the two. But simple to use. There's nothing to turn on, nothing to turn off. Slap it on the patient, and it will attach it to the patient, and it will uh, display the temperature. So my call's over, we'll move to page two with the arrow in the lower left-hand side. A Couple of keys here that you've seen before. This is the black and white key, changes my screen to black and white. This is an alarm key. We can go in here and set specific alarms for this particular patient, or we can do a stat set. If you're doing a longer transfer per se, and you want to use the stat set button, what that does is set every alarm on the device at a predetermined, roughly 20% above and below the last round of vitals. So for instance, I have a patient that's 120 over 80, I'm going to Rochester, so I use the stat set key. Four blood pressures down the road, they have a 200 over 100, it will alarm at you to, to tell you that that blood pressure's out of the normal range. That's a patient by patient setting. That resets when you turn the monitor on. Correct, yep. 
or you can do the alarms individually, or another way you can do the alarms, if you just want a blood pressure alarm, alarm, remember you can highlight that section and change the alarm there as well. The key you'll use the most on this screen is the log or the memory. The log is what we refer to as our memory. There's a couple of different areas here. The top chart is the patient's chart, which will be what I did and why I did it, meaning it will say at 10 o'clock I defibrillated, it will give you that 10 second strip because they were in V-fib. Second key down are trends. Trends, again, are our numeric values only. Trends are gonna be my blood pressures, my entitled CO2, my temps, heart rates, anything that has a number attached to it. Fourth key down, you remember I said there's a USB port over here. We can pop that over to the USB if you want. But I believe, and we'll probably talk about this a little later, that you will be uploading these via Wi-Fi on the trucks into ImageTrend, and I'll walk you through that process at a different time of how we pull that information into ImageTrend. Um, those tablets will be set up. You're probably a little familiar with that as well. Yeah, we use the, the Zoll software. Yep. But yeah, gotcha. We just, I don't think ours currently does the wireless, though. Okay. We just use the USBs. Yep. There is a trash can on here, but if you remember I mentioned before, the memory deletes itself when needed, so there is really no reason to use the trash can. <coughs> Settings are my configuration. That's more for the biomed department. I told you before, there's a lot of things that we can change on these devices. This is where I would go in. It is password protected, but just so you know what it is. General maintenance on the X-Series, you can use cavicide wipes. We do recommend staying away from pure bleach products. They are water resistant, not waterproof, so you can spray them down and wipe them off. Please do not submerge the devices. Other than that, maintenance is rotate the batteries, turn it on on a daily basis to check that it passes the self-test. Last test you can do per your protocols is plug the electrotherapy cable into this tester. It says test at 30 joules. We would go down to 30 joules, charge the device, deliver the shock, it'll tell you a test passed. By using this block, what we're testing is the cable itself. The internal components of the defibrillator are tested when it is turned on. I believe that is everything. Paper. Paper, how to change the paper. Paper is a two-part process. In the pouch with my parameters. Hold the bag down, black door up. It is a roll of paper that comes out here. Notice it does feed in one way or it will not print. It is a thermal printer, so it does need to come out with the bottom out first. There is a picture in there when you take the roll out showing you which way that goes, okay? <coughs> If the printer is not printing, it is not out of ink. More than likely, the paper is in upside down. It is thermal paper. It only prints on one side. <clears throat> it is rolled paper, and it does print a grid when needed. So there is no grid on the paper today, but if you're doing a 12 lead or anything that has an ECG tracing on it, it prints the grid. We did that so you can read the numbers and interpretive statement and things easier. Other questions? Can you do the right side of the uh, We know that we're connected. I'll answer that in a second. We know that we're connected here by the green parentheses. You'll either be connected to the truck that you're in or the failsafe is the USB port. If you are changing monitors to trucks, we simply go to the green tower and switch which truck we are in. Okay? It will always look for the primary truck, which is the green check mark first. You can do a right-sided 12 lead, but we recommend to note it on the printout as well as any transmission because it does not tell you. <clears throat> Other questions? Real time, mode we're in, run time of the battery as well as how long the call has went on. Battery will show full, three plus hours, two plus hour, one plus hour at 15 minutes. It will flash yellow at you as well as flash on the screen to either plug it in or replace the battery. Any questions, please let me know. I believe that'll be the end of the in-service for today. Thank you.